My name is Lauren Oback. I'm the moderator for today. I want to sincerely welcome everyone here. I know it's a beautiful day. We're really happy that you're here with us. Just a reminder, since we are recording this session, it will also be on YouTube within the next couple of days. We've been getting quite a few views on there. So feel free to check up uh, to catch up on any of the programs that we've done with Arthur on there. This is our fourth session of the New York City Architecture Series. The final session will be in two weeks, which is April 27th, also at two o'clock. And that topic will be the Chrysler Building. If you registered for this program and received the Zoom invitation from the library, not from a friend, it means that you're automatically registered for the program in two weeks. And we've also automatically registered you for the program that's going to be held on Monday the 18th about Ukraine, and that one will be at two o'clock. For this session, we encourage stories, comments, questions. We'd love for you to put those into the chat or use the raise hand feature. Those we can see right away. We'll also stop periodically to see if you have any questions and we'll have time at the end for a little bit of Q&A and sharing stories. If you want to comment with your microphone, just make sure that you either put it in chat, use the raise hand or turn your microphone on and just get our attention because there is a delay and sometimes you miss the first part of that question. So just get our attention first. As you come in automatically, you are muted, but your camera is on. You can change those settings at any time. You can change the closed caption settings at any time. And now I'm going to introduce Arthur Gottlieb, a local historian on, on the topics of political and military history. He was also a former professional curator at the Intrepid, and he was an auxiliary officer in the US Coast Guard. He currently works as a counselor and certified senior advisor and works extensively with veterans who are returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. And he's here today to talk about the Brooklyn Bridge. Welcome, Arthur. Thank you so much. <clears throat> you know, out of all the people who introduce me, you're always the best. So thank you for that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. As, as well, as so do I. So hi, everyone. Uh, today, we've got a great program for you on the Brooklyn Bridge, and it's one of my uh, favorites, um, and it is um, with sadness that Brooklyn also reminds us of that crazy shooting that went on, what was it, yesterday down in Brooklyn. So with that aside, and I just wanted to mention it. Um, I hope that you have had the chance in your lifetime to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, somehow driving over it really isn't the same experience. And I'm going to go to my PowerPoint presentation. Here it is. That's not the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, but it is an awfully nice picture. I just wanted to get you in a New York state of mind here. Isn't that beautiful? So what a great picture. Liberty Island in the foreground, um, Hudson River, East River to the right side, the sun uh, mm -hmm. rising on the east of the island, Jersey City to the left, really nice. So here's a, uh, a classic black and white shot of the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, the first major suspension bridge um, of its type like this in the Northeast. And, um, you know, New York City was a place that was, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> already teeming with people early on in our history. Uh, even before uh, the United States was its own nation, even as a, as, uh, a British colony. Um, first from the, uh, the Dutch, then uh, New Amsterdam, over then to New, New York um, by the British. And the biggest suburb that New York had was Brooklyn. 
Now, Brooklyn was its own city uh, up until 1898 when you had the incorporation of Greater New York as it's known today in the five boroughs. Um, so you had Manhattan, uh, which was just called New York City, right? Because that was New York City and uh, Brooklyn being its own, its own city had its own identity. Uh, a lot of people today would consider Brooklyn to have its own identity as well. I dated a girl from Brooklyn and um, back um, some 33, 34 years ago. And um, she was very, very proud of being from Brooklyn. It was like a whole thing, you know. I mean, I came from a different part of New York City, and I'm not sure she thought that I was good enough. So, but she and I, uh, that's back when before I had some injuries and uh, I was a runner and she was a runner and we would make it a point to run across the Brooklyn Bridge and back from Brooklyn to Manhattan and then back over. And that was, you know, that part of that experience was a good memory. Yeah, we did this last time, I think, uh, with the five boroughs of uh, New York City. Uh, number one, of course, being Manhattan, for those of you who weren't part of the program. Uh, number two, of course, being Brooklyn, here on the southwestern tip of Long Island, right? That's Coney Island right over here where my cursor is. Um, the waterway, this is, Ambrose out here down below in the Atlantic Ocean. There's an, a light tower there now. There used to be a light ship called the Ambrose Light Ship, but now the Ambrose Light Tower. And then you come up through a point between um, Brooklyn and Staten Island. And this is a waterway known as the Verrazano Narrows. And of course, the bridge that goes across it is called the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And then up to the upper bay, you have uh, once again the small island to the left here in blue is Liberty Island. And then you have Ellis Island immediately north of it. The blue island that's larger over here is Governor's Island, which used to be uh, a Coast Guard facility. Um, the uh, large north-south waterway to the west of Manhattan is the Hudson River, and you can travel that straight up to Albany and points even past. And then you have on the east side of uh, Manhattan, in between Manhattan and Brooklyn and number three, which is Queens, is the East River which isn't really a river, by the way, it's a tidal estuary connecting the two different portions of tidal bodies, one being the Atlantic Ocean and one being the Long Island Sound. And uh, then you have uh, number four, of course, the re in red, the only part of New York City, which is um, on the mainland, which is the borough of the Bronx. Up here to the northern right, uh, is uh, City Island and then Hart Island. And, um, and then there's the Westchester County border right over here. This is Far Rockaway down here on the bottom, which as you can see by the color being orange is actually part of Queens. And everything in gray to the west over here is uh, Jersey. And then the gray on the right side is Nassau County. So the Brooklyn Bridge, which was in service in the 1880s, this was something that a lot of people wanted to be the one who was going to get to build the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, this was going to be it building a bridge across the most important waterway in the busiest city anywhere. Uh, I mean, that was going to be bragging rights for eternity. 
and you would have to be pretty good to be able to be the one to get chosen to do this <clears throat> and have the design and all the rest of that. And that person turned out to be somebody named John Roblin. Here he is, John Roebling, born in 1806. <clears throat> Excuse me, notice that he dies in 1869, right? So this is technically speaking before the Brooklyn Bridge was built, right? Which is actually part of our story today. Now, John Roblin is a person that is from an era in the mid 19th century that you had enough technical knowledge based on scientific developments and advancements. And you also had enough modern materials in the form of the manufacture of metal, copper, iron, uh, other chemicals, um, where you can actually be in, in, in this, golden, this golden age of inventors like Thomas Edison. I'd like you to think of Thomas Edison or somebody like that. It's a good model when you're thinking about it, John Roebling. Now, this is a long time before the internet or anything else like that, of course. Now, how people like Roebling made things happen was the fact that they were the, the tinkerer the inventor, the person who actually built the thing like, you know, Steve Jobs in his garage, right? In the golden age of, you know, um, like invention of computers and or home computers, I should say. And he was the one who figured out how to do it. And when I say it, I mean, of course, this the suspension bridge. And um, we see these things around all of our lives. And so it's like, what's the big deal? But it was a pretty big deal before any, anybody ever built one of these things. And it is, if you like architecture and you like mechanical things and you like the laws of physics, the suspension bridge is, it is elegant in its design, in the standpoint of not because it's pretty to look at. From a mechanical, physical standpoint, it is a perfect combination of suspension. In other words, the force of tension, something being pulled, and compression, the force of something being squeezed. It is in perfect balance. Now, I hope there's some of you in there who actually appreciate mechanical stuff, because I want you to get you excited a little bit about it. At the same time, I'm walking a fine line because I don't want to bore you to tears either, okay? So John Roebling is a European. He's a European, a Central European, and like anybody who wants to be famous, you're not gonna get famous as an engineer in Europe. There's too much of a set structure of who gets to do what in the old world, right? So if you wanna break through and make a name for yourself and have the freedom to create in a place where it was a frontier that was open for for, for things that needed to be built, like bridges, you came to the United States of America. And that's what John Roebling did. He came to the US. And in the years after the Civil War, we were building uh, a, a mostly railroads. And you needed bridges for railroads. You had all kinds of new industrial settings in different cities and things needed to be bridged to be able to bring materials and trains, not cars yet, of course, 
Uh, but John Roebling was right there at the forefront of all of this. And it was a small world, you know, the people who were the bridge builders, right? And if I do a series on for you on, um, I don't know, nuclear physicists, you know what? It's gonna be 10 people who all know each other, right? If I do a, a program for you on, famous photographers of the 20th century. It was a relatively small club of people and they knew each other. They were famous, but they all knew each other, you know? And that's the way it was with bridge builders. There was only a handful of them. And if there was gonna be a bridge that was gonna be des uh, designed and chosen to be put anywhere, I mean, it was probably going to be between the same competitors you had from the last job where you were bidding on a bridge or trying to get your design approved. John Roebling. Now, this is his son, Washington Roebling. Now, Washington Roebling was also an engineer and was following in his father's footsteps, and they actually were partners and Washington Roebling was somebody who knew his father's methods and designs better than anyone. And this is all to weigh heavily on our program today as far as Washington Roebling's knowledge about his father's bridge building techniques. <clears throat> and here's a photograph from uh, approximately 1870. You can see that he was born in 1837 and passed away in 1926. That's a pretty good age for people back in those days. <clears throat> now scattered around our country, especially on the, in the Eastern part of our country, which was the first part of our country to be heavily in, um, developed. Um, there are, a lot of artifacts from the early era of in the industrial age and transportation systems. Now, luckily, this is a structure that had it not been recognized for who built it, probably just would have been destroyed because it was obsolete. It is the Delaware Aqueduct, uh, Delaware River, Lackawax in Pennsylvania, right? Um, Pennsylvania to New York. John Roebling was the engineer on this thing. And it was, it was an aqueduct originally. In other words, it had some kind of a platform to bridge this river, but it wasn't designed for passenger transportation. It was designed for, uh, to carry a big pipe. It was an aqueduct. Now it was completed in 1848. Uh, which was, of course, before the American Civil War. And as my note said, uh, it was abandoned in 1898. You know, there was other technology or to, you know, bury the pipes or whatever it was. And structures like this, it, it was just abandoned. Um, and as I said, because it was a Roebling structure and Roebling was already famous, in the 20th century because of the Brooklyn Bridge and other bridges. This one was saved and it was actually in a rudimentary form at least, restored as an actual walking bridge. Now, with the good thing about this, it is what I wanna show you is the basic elements of what makes a suspension bridge a suspension bridge. You see, you see these um, towers here, Right, in this case, it's a multiple towered affair. And in between each tower, there is a cable, okay? A flexible cable, a very large yet flexible cable, right? That is um, because of gravity is pulled into an inverted arch or parabola or catenary, choose your word, okay? And on top of every one of these towers, there is something called a saddle, okay? Where this, where this cable can rest, you see, without it being chafed or bent, right? And 
actually, this is one long cable that goes down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up. And on either end of this cable, it is actually tied into the ground permanently by something called an anchorage, right? So some way this cable is firmly adhered to the ground. Now, what that does, because the ends of the cable are firmly attached, that means that anything that is hanging from these intermediate arches is gonna be pulling down on the cable by gravity. Yet, because the ends of the cable are firmly attached, they're not going anywhere. And that means that these intermediate arches can carry weight, you see? Think of it like um, having a piece of um, string. And if you pull the string, the other end of the, the, the bitter end of the string would actually pull towards you, you see, right? And if that end of the string was firmly attached to something and you pulled it, you would be able to put tension on it, you see? I mean, I'm using elementary examples, but maybe that's the best way to explain this. And from the center cables, you have vertical cables that are hanging off of that cable, you see? And from those vertical cables, you can actually attach that to some kind of a roadway. So essentially that roadway is being hung from those main cables. And another word from hung from is suspended from. And this is where the name of suspension bridge comes from. A suspension bridge is a bridge where the, um, the roadway is suspended from those large cables that go over the top of the towers and then down to the anchorages. That's the suspension bridge. See, here's a good drawing. See, so with the anchorages on either side, it's as I was just explaining to you, without the anchorages and without the center cable, right, that is, forming this inverse parabola in between the two towers. You see, I mean, the weight of the roadway is just gonna pull the whole thing down, it's not gonna work. But with the cable being continued on and then anchored firmly into the ground on either side, okay, you can see how that's that compression and tension working against each other in perfect balance. So any suspension bridge you go over, the George Washington Bridge, many, many others, the Pharaoh's Down and Narrows Bridge that I mentioned, you will always see the main cables coming up from an anchorage on both sides of this pan. And then they'll go over the towers and then create a very large catenary in between. Now, here is a bridge that Roebling and Washington, uh, Washington and John Roebling built that was really the precursor to the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. And this is still there, by the way. It's called the Cincinnati Bridge and Cincinnati Suspension Bridge across the Ohio River. And this was uh, something that was built in the 1860s uh, also. Uh, 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, you know, back in those days, it took a while to build things like this. It was, don't forget that it was before the age of electricity. And besides the fact that you did have steam engines, uh, most of the work was still done by hand in, in a way that was similar to the way that it wouldn't be unfair to say that it was done in a similar way that the Egyptians built the pyramid, okay? This bridge is still here. Uh, you can see, um, I'll show you another photograph later, side by side of the Brooklyn Bridge to the Cincinnati Bridge. You can see the family resemblance in the design of the tower, even though the Cincinnati Bridge has one arch and the Brooklyn Bridge being much larger, has a different design of two Gothic arches on each tower. Other than that, you can clearly see the resemblance of the, uh, the design. 
Now, another place where Roebling built a bridge was if you've ever been to Niagara Falls, just right up river from where the falls are, was the largest at, at, in its day, the largest suspension bridge anywhere. And that was across the Niagara River. Um, and the reason I have this in here is not just because, you know, here's another bridge that Roebling built. And by the way, this was for trains. This was for train traffic. The area up by the Niagara River was heavily industrialized uh, early on because of the natural energy that could be attained from the fact of the water flowing over Niagara Falls, right? So in the late, uh, 19, uh, the late 19th century, uh, you had now the beginnings of uh, the early electrical generation systems, et cetera. A lot of manufacturing going on in places where there's a, a, a strong water flow, okay? Because even without electricity, you can drive uh, paddled wheels, right? That are being driven by the force of the river. And that will be on an axle that will turn some kind of a gearing system and grind weed or do other kinds of work that's necessary in manufacture, a reliable source of power, you see. But now you have this area which is literally burgeoning 1880, 1890, uh, because of the fact that now you've got the Niagara generating station, which is going to be completed there, you see. Um, we can talk about hydroelectricity another day. My point here is that notice on the advertisement of which this picture is part of, right? It is John A. Roble, but they're not advertising the fact that it's his bridge. They're advertising the fact that the bridge is made out of wire rope, otherwise known as cable. Now, you and I, we, there's always been cable around, right? In my lifetime, you could always go to the hardware store and use cable, right? And all of the Navy ships that I worked on and the, the shipyards and the boatyards, there was a lot of cable, right? Big cable, right? The cable looks like, if you look at like a big uh, length of rope, you notice that the wire, the, that the rope is actually woven together. What Roebling needed to figure out how to do is make something that was like rope because you needed it for a suspension bridge, but it couldn't be rope because rope was too, it was going to degrade, it was going to become weaker. You needed something that was going to be made out of iron wire that could be woven into a rope. And he was the one who invented this and patented it. And that's a pretty big deal, you see? So because he wants to build a suspension bridge, he literally first has to invent cable. And he does, and he patents the manufacturing process, which is similar to the factory, the process of actually making rope, except it's not rope, it's made out of metal. And so his company was in Trenton, New Jersey, and it was the John Roebling Wire Works, right? So he actually invents this. And now that this is invented, well, now you can make a suspension bridge. Here's another one that was, uh, that the Roeblings had their hand in uh, designing and constructing. This is the Allegheny Bridge in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, circa 1860. And once again, you can see clearly the same basic elements in any suspension bridge. You've got the anchorage on either side. The main cables that are attached to the anchorage come up over the towers. And it doesn't matter how many towers there are, you see. And then you've got the vertical suspenders. And the roadway is literally suspended a suspension bridge. So John Roblin 
because of his expertise and his competence and his track record of building these very large bridges um, that are durable, not unattractive, right? And he is actually selected to build the first bridge over the East River in New York City. Now, this is the golden ticket, all right? Like I was telling you before, because there were like 10 other people who would have killed Roebling for that opportunity. Now, the thing here is, is that you, like, you have to be, you have to be everybody at once to get that done. You have to be the politician. Like Roebling had to go and he had to schmooze all of these politicians. You see, because there was a lot of money involved in this. And think about it this way, okay? Wherever that bridge was going to be, in this particular case, in Manhattan to Brooklyn, the people on one side of the bridge and the other side of the bridge, whoever owned all that real estate was gonna become remarkably wealthy, you see? So there's a tremendous amount of politics with bridge building, right? Every time there was a bridge built anywhere, there was tremendous money pressures to put the bridge a certain place because those people own the property up here or they own the property over there or they had the opportunity to make a fortune one way or the other, you see? And he had to go in there and he had to grease the wheels and he had to um, appease the proper politicians or it was never getting done. I don't know if you know this or not. I don't think it's merely speculative to say that New York City, like many other metropolis, were a little on the corrupt side, okay? And people wanted to have their palms greased and you needed to get the say so from the Tammany Halls of the world, et cetera. And Roebling, he was a guy who just wanted to be there with a sharp pencil drawing things and building things. And he had to go out there and he had to make it all happen. And he did. And finally that is happening. Now, you know where the Brooklyn Bridge is, right? So he is there now and his project is a go. And he's there on the Brooklyn side of the East River and he's taking surveying measurements, right, about where the towers are gonna be for the, uh, for the Brooklyn side of the bridge and Manhattan side of the bridge. Now, back in those days, there still was a lot of traffic going across the East River. There wasn't a bridge yet, but it was done by ferry. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on a ferry, Right. Uh, think about, I don't know, the Staten Island Ferry, for instance. That was something I was on a lot. So it was you when you bring the ferry into the, the ferry station. There are these wooden kind of like walls that taper down. So in case the ferry operator, um, I don't know, isn't exactly aimed perfectly. Right. The ferry can actually bounce off of these wooden structures and then just sort of like channel his way in there, right? Sometimes it's very smooth, sometimes it's sloppy. And when you hit the abutment, sometimes it's a real jar, you see? So there's Washington Roebling and he is deep in thought, deep in thought. And he's not really concerned about the fact that there's this massive pile right next to him of these huge pilings, pilings, which is like a nautical term for like these big poles, right? And think about it as if there was a stack of telephone poles right next to you, you see? Now there are ferries all over the East River and people are bustling back and forth. I mean, it's already a big metropolis in the 19th century, right? And there are ferries coming in constantly all over the place. He's standing right next to a ferry terminal, right? He's standing in between a ferry terminal and this big pile of pilings. The ferry operator gets a little sloppy coming in and he bumps the abutment, boom, bounces off. Now this jars loose the whatever retaining system is holding this pile of pilings 
next to John Roebling. And all of these pilings fall on him. They crush his leg. He's alive. He's okay even, but they crush his leg, right? Now, this is not long after the American Civil War and, you know, what's the prescription for something like that? You got to saw your leg off, right? And there's no way that John Roebling is having his leg sewn off. You see, not only that, even beyond that, the guy's kind of a, a 19th century naturalist, right? He's going to heal himself. He's going to heal himself. Right, so what happens to his leg, right? It gets, well, I don't know what the terms were, septic, it got gangrened, right? Whatever it was, it killed him. He's dead. It spreads to his whole body. And the guy is at the cusp of what he has led his entire life to his major achievement. And he's right there. And now he's dead. And now, I mean, you know, the money is already flowing in to build a bridge and the politics are already there and the design is there and people are like, well, now what do we do? You know, we're going to have to find somebody else to build this damn bridge, right? So the logical choice then becomes Washington Roebling, right? Because as I said to you earlier, nobody knows Washington Roebling, uh, John Roebling's uh, construction techniques like Washington Roebling. So Washington Roebling gets promoted up to the hand engineer. Now that dad is dead. And the bridge building proceeds. Right. I wonder if you ever thought about how a tower is built in the middle of a running stream of water right, a river, you know, whether it's in the East River or the Hudson River or the, uh, Ver uh, the Verrazano Narrows or in San Francisco Bay or anywhere. I mean, how do you do that, right? I mean, it's underwater, you see, and you've got to have some kind of a massive structural base to support all of this weight. And obviously it's got to be, you can't build it on shifting sand. And it's also remember that this is like, we're talking about civil war technology here. You see, so how do you do that? And back in these days, you use something called a caisson, right? Right, like that song, the caisson comes marching along or wherever it was, right? And what a caisson is, imagine like, um, if I was to take a, uh, a, a really solid cigar box, and I was to cut out the bottom of the cigar box where the four sides of the box and the top of the box were still there, right? That is the caisson. And it's got to be really thick and it's got to be super sturdy. I'm talking about like oak, two feet thick, right? With these massive wrought iron brackets and everything holding the thing together, right? Now, this is crazy. This is really like Dante's Inferno stuff we're talking about here. They build it on right on the edge of the water where it needs to be used, right? And where it needs to be used is where the two towers are going to be. And uh, they launch it like a boat, right? They slide it right into the waterway. Now, when this goes into the water, it settles down, but it doesn't sink, right? Because what happens is that there's a pocket of air that's trapped inside of it even though the bottom is completely open. There's a pocket of air that's trapped inside because it's essentially airtight. Then they float it out exactly where the tower is going to be. Then they open up these valves and they let the air out and it sinks exactly where the tower is gonna be. Now, the sides of the thing, because they are cut to a knife edge, the weight of this massive structure actually sinks and kind of by gravity digs its way down through the soft mud and things like that in the bottom. Well, now what? You can't build a tower on top of that. No. So now here's what you do. Now the thing is firmly set in the bottom. You start actually taking some of the very large stones that are going to be 
the basic building structure of the towers and you start putting them in place on top of this thing. Now what happens is the weight of it pushes down even further. And now you create a pathway down to the top of this thing. It's not that far under the water. And men crawl down there and they actually open up these doors on the top of it. And the water that's trapped in there now, okay, is pumped out and it's sealed. It's sealed to the outside. So if you pump the water out and you pump air in, men can crawl inside of this thing now. And the reason for the men to crawl inside of it is so they could dig out all of the mud and all of the dirt. And as they dig, the, the dirt is brought out through these other special um, like dumb waders dumped out and then they keep digging. And as they dig the bottom out, the weight that is being increased on the top of this thing and the fact that they're digging out the bottom causes it to sink even further. And they keep doing that until they hit some kind of a hard bedrock, you see? I mean, this is Rick, can you imagine being in there? And there's no electricity. So they're using kerosene lamps and all kinds of other crazy things. There's no air, there's no oxygen. You've got the combustion byproducts of the kerosene lamps and everything else like that. Um, I mean, it's dark, it's damp, there's fish flopping around, there's probably dead bodies knowing New York City, right? Now, there's no pictures of this, okay? But here's kind of a drawing of it. Uh, I wonder how well you can see it on your, on your device. You know, so you got these men down here. That's why I called it Dante's Inferno. It's kind of like this hellish kind of biblical interpretation of you know, what happens to a person when you sinned too much during your life, you know, and you're down here and you're, you got shovels and you're putting them in these wheelbarrows and the dirt is being carted up out the top and the thing keeps sinking further and further down. And as this is all happening, the, the crew on top of the caisson is the bricklaying crew. And they're actually building course upon course upon course of bricks, the first of which are all underwater, of course, see? And then finally, the bricks are emerging above the water. I mean, it's an amazing proposition, the whole thing. All right, this is one of the, you know, I don't know if you, I don't want to bore you with this, but it's kind of like getting it out of a submarine. You've got to have different chambers that equalize the air and all the rest of that stuff. You see, here's another drawing I was able to find from an encyclopedia of this method. You got literally men here with pickaxes and shovels, shoveling, and, and they would pick up through this watertight um, compartment. You would literally pick up the debris and it would be carted off and then they bring it back down and pick it up again. And the thing kept going further and further and further down until they hit you know, what's called bedrock or some kind of a hard substrate. All right, I'll just go to the next slide. This is Washington Roebling. Now in the photograph, he's sitting there and he's looking out over the Brooklyn Bridge from Brooklyn. What has happened to Washington Roebling is that I wonder, I wonder if there are any divers in the audience. Um, I used to have my dive certificate, right, which I got when I was, I don't know, 24, 25 years old and in a lot better physical shape than I am now. And, um, you know, so in other words, I was licensed to be able to go and buy rent dive equipment and dive on whatever it was underwater. You have to go through a lot of training and you know that, you can only be a certain amount of time underwater given the depth because every 33 feet approximately the pressure on whatever it is that's underwater at 33 feet is gonna be twice that of the pressure that's on sea level, right? So now these caissons are way down there, you see? 
so even though they're down working underwater, their bodies are actually under pressure. And um, it's affecting people's bodies this way. The, the fluid in our lungs, uh, not our lungs, but the alveoli, et cetera, in our joints, in our arteries, in our veins, fluid itself is non-compressible to outside pressure. You see, it's non-compressible. But the thing is with human blood is this human blood is there to carry oxygen, right? So is oxygen, lubin, and nitrogen. And oxygen and nitrogen are compressible, see? So if you're underwater 100 feet, that means that you can only be down there a certain amount of time because what happens is your body is under pressure and you don't feel it at the time. But what has happened is inside your blood, the oxygen has been squeezed, it's been compressed. You see, and in that compressed state, it actually winds up around your joints and your elbows and your hips uh, and anywhere there's joints. That's just the way it, it collects. You see, now, none of that's a problem until you actually come back to the surface and the force on those compressed gases are uncompressed. Right. Because now you're coming back up to atmospheric pressure. Now, uh, the best way to describe this was if you've ever bought a bottle of seltzer. Um, or carbonated water, and you look at it inside the bottom, the bottle, it's, it looks like water, you see, but really inside that seltzer are compressed gases that are compressed so tightly because it's pressurized. And then what happens when you unscrew the lid and you, you subject that compressed gas to atmospheric pressure, which is less, then the gas now is able to uncompress and turn into large bubbles. Well, when the person comes back up to the surface after being compressed for a long time, all of those compressed gases that are now accumulated around one's joints uncompress. And it is phenomenally painful. Painful in such a sense that you will fall on the ground, writhing in pain, bent into a fetal position. And that is why they called it the bends. And what you keep doing this over and over and over again, and it's going to cause permanent paralysis. Now, there's one day in the case on one of the case on, I don't remember which one it was, I think it was a New York case on where you know, they've got all these kerosene lamps down there. And the way that they make these caissons waterproof is with the old fashioned junk that they used to use on sailing ships, you know, pitch, tar, cloth impregnated in pitch and tar. I mean, in other words, it was extraordinarily flammable. All you need is one mistake with a kerosene lamp or something like that, and boom, the whole thing's on fire, right? And that's what happened. And it created a tremendous amount of damage to this thing. And uh, so Washington Roebling, who wanted to be a good leader, a good team player, what didn't want to send his men down there to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself under those horrible conditions of cleaning out the dead bodies and the charred wood and all the rest of that down in the caisson. So he went down personally as a team leader, right, to show, you know, he, wa he wanted to be a good boss. And he was getting the bends. Right, he was getting the bends, and but he pressed on because nobody really knew what the bends were. You know, I mean, it could have been anything, right? You know, he kept going down every day, and until he became completely paralyzed. Right. Another term for the bends, by the way, is caisson disease, because this is where it happened. You see, and uh, so now Washington wrote his father's dead, and the bridge is not nearly completed. And now he's permanently paralyzed, right? Now this is, how should we say, messed up for the, for the Roblings, right? So now all he hit in his bind is okay. He just can't move, right? And so he's still capable as an engineer, but he, he wants to be a hands-on guy. He wants to be the one down there with the, with the foremans and the workmen, you know, pointing out different things on blueprints and he can't do it at all. So now something very, very unusual happens. He, uh, I wanna step in one of the heroes of this story, 
an untold hero in history, one Emily Warren Roebling, right? Washington's wife. And she steps in and says, Washington, you remain the head engineer of this program. Don't let you, them throw you off. I will bring your daily instructions back and forth to the bridge for you since you can't move. Now, can you imagine this? This woman coming down with these, you know, these Victorian clothes and saying, you know, to some burly, you know, foreman, oh, Washington says you're doing this wrong. I mean, think about this for a minute. But Emily Warren is really the hero of the story here from this regard. And that's how the British Bridge is completed, with Emily Roebling being the interface between Washington and the actual physical construction of the bridge. And there is uh, what the tower looks like uh, when they're being uh, constructed. And keep in mind that every one of the blocks they're putting here are hand cut blocks, hand cut, okay? Uh, the best example of something like this that still exists is if you live near, um, I don't know, Metro North tracks, right? And a lot of the original roadways that go underneath Metro North, you'll see these big brown rectangular blocks with these irregular faces on them. Those were all hand cut from the same exact era of when this was built. Those blocks, there's not two the same because they were all cut by hand and they were deliberately faced, you know, by chisels and things like that. So they would have a natural sort of a look to them. And that's a good way to get an example of how these blocks were built and then they glued them together with cement and you can see that's before you know electricity or anything like that uh, and they're literally put them to putting them together in, in the same fashion that the Romans would have done and there it is going up and it's really something so the Brooklyn Tower is almost complete and you can see that um, they are using something called false work. Uh, when you want to build an arch, you build a wooden frame of an arch, right? And then you put the ball of the bricks around it. And then finally, when the arch is completed, it'll sustain itself. But until that point, if you don't have something called a false work, you can't build an arch, right? And that's what it looks like going up. 1875. Right, here's a fabulous photograph. It's actually part of a panorama of photographs. You know, they didn't have panoramic photographs, but what you could do is you could take 10 photographs and kind of like match them up and glue them together. And you can see the seam over here towards the left, right? That's what this was. I have one of these pictures out in my, um, in my hallway here um, that I bought uh, down into the, at the precursor to the South Street Seaport Museum before that was even there when I was younger. And it, it is all of the different photographs from this series together. And uh, so it's a photograph taken from the Brooklyn Tower of the New York Tower, looking over Manhattan and over the Hudson River to Jersey, right? And that's what lower Manhattan looked like back in these days, see? And you can see this is where like South Street Seaport Museum is down over here, Pier 17. And of course, you had all of these, you know, this is where the Fulton Fish Market was, by the way. OK. And, you know, so a lot of you had all of this fresh seafood and coming over and everything else like that. And to the right of the tower, you can see one of those ferry terminals I was telling you about that were all up and down the East River. Oops. Now, the next thing that has to happen, here's something also that, um, that uh, Roebling had to invent. How do you get that main cable from one anchorage to the other, right? Now, you don't have one cable that's some one massive piece of steel, like, you know, two feet thick, okay? What you have really in any suspension system across the bridge, you've got large you've got wires that are individual wires and each wire is individually spun like you were making a 
I don't know, like a tapestry or a carpet or something like that, or, or some kind of a cloth weave. It's literally spun from one end anchorage over the both towers down to the other anchorage and then back, right? 10,000 times until it's a series of bundles of wire. And then you wrap that up. And what that gives you is flexibility and redundancy, you see? But how do you do that? I mean, we're talking about things of enormous proportions here. Washington Roebling invents it. He invents the system to do this. And you wind up with the first cables going across. And then of course, these people over here, the ones with the big, you know, the Lincoln hats and all the rest of that. I mean, for a photograph like this, they're probably the investors or something like that because you get special photo ops. And notice that it says, if you're gonna walk along these cables, right? then you bet don't walk together, right? Because that'll create a that'll create a resonance in the cable. You see, uh, what I mean by a resonance is I want you to think about like a tuning fork, right? If you take a tuning fork and you tap it, it's an imperfect resonance and it goes for a long time until the second law of thermodynamics causes that resonance to dissipate. Okay. Um, suspension bridges, because they are like big springs, can actually gain a resonance. And that means that the bridge can technically shake it itself apart. And that has actually happened in history of bridges that weren't designed properly. Now, all of this wire that's got to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. I mean, you can't manufacture 50 miles of wire. I mean, if you took all the wire that was like in the George Washington Bridge or something like that, going across on the cables and GW has four cables, right? Well, as does the Brooklyn Bridge for that matter. And I mean, it, 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 you'd be able to, it would be a continuous piece of wire that would stretch from like here to the moon and back for some astronomical length, right? And um, so you have to have different spools of wire that you actually splice together. You see now, as a matter of conflict of interest, since Washington Roebling was the head engineer of the bridge, right? And he was using, he, he was part owner, of course, because of his father of the Roebling Wire Works, right? Which was the best manufacturer of wire rope in the world. You couldn't be both. You couldn't own the company that was supplying the wire or be the engineer. So what the Roebling Works had to step out as a contender for supplying the wire for the Brooklyn Bridge. And there was competitors around. So they used a different brand of wire. And what was happening during one of these in the manufacture of the wire for the Brooklyn Bridge was you're manufacturing these wires. The wire had to be tested right, for quality assurance. And then every now and then you have some wire that didn't, it didn't meet specifications. And it went out into this yard, into this, into this large shed where the discarded wire was, the, the wire that had fast in, that did not pass inspection. And somebody noticed that as time was going by, the pile of wire that should have been getting bigger was actually getting smaller and an investigation was made. And it turns out that some unscrupulous people in that company were actually sneaking the defective wire back into the wire that was being sent to the Brooklyn Bridge manufacturer. So Washington Roebling was faced with this problem now. He had to calculate the potentiality of how much defective wire had already been spun permanently into the cabling system of the Brooklyn Bridge. What a pain. So what do you do? Do you take it all apart and start from scratch? Maybe have the same thing happen again? So see, the, 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 the cables on the Brooklyn Bridge were actually a little bit larger than they were intended to be by design because Washington Roebling decided to just, as a matter of redundancy, add extra wire to each one of the cables and make the cable bundle larger 
to make up for the potential of the defective wire, which is still there in the Brooklyn Bridge. Interesting, right? Now this idiot, I mean, this, um, this um, daring person, <laughs> you know, there's gotta be somebody who wants to be the first person to cross the East River on the Brooklyn Bridge, right? He's not exactly on the Brooklyn Bridge, but what can I say? Uh, I have a feeling here that alcohol was involved somehow in this. Um, I'll let you be the judge. Here's a nice picture, right? Now, the reason I stuck this picture in here, I mean, because it's nice enough by itself, you know, but, you know, with the boat and everything else like that, with this cat boat. But you can see the tower of the Brooklyn Bridge right over there. And what they're doing is they're beginning the roadway. When you're building a roadway, from the tower out equally, on both towers equally. Um, and that has to be done that way because the weight on the cabling has to be proportional on both sides. Remember I told you it's a giant spring, right? If you put too much on one side, it's gonna disturb the other side because the whole thing is flexible until it's in the proper format where the cables are, suspending what is designed to suspend. Um, those of you who are mechanical will understand what I'm talking about. Now, there's a great shot of the profile of the, um, of the in this case, the Manhattan Tower. It's a good silhouette. I use this one because I wanna show you that what Roebling gave us was he gave us vertical suspenders in between the main hanger cable, you see? And he also gave us, as a matter of redundancy, these diagonal cables, right? Now, the diagonal cables are called stays, S-T-A-Y-S. It's a term that was borrowed from ship rigging, okay? So the vertical ones are the vertical suspenders. The diagonal one are called stays, you see? Now, this is a long time before computer-aided design. What Roebling did was he took a belt and suspender approach, right? You ever see somebody wearing a belt and suspenders, right? And um, that's what this is, right? I mean, in modern calculations of the Brooklyn Bridge, it's been determined that you didn't really need the diagonal cable stays, that the thing would hold itself up with the verticals, but that's easy to say for us, right? With all of this, you know, this modern accoutrement, you see? And not only that, but the, di the, the diagonal stays give all of the Roebling bridges this beautiful web-like feature, right? It's pretty, or I always thought it was pretty, you see? Uh, this thing, by the way, hanging underneath the, uh, the roadway, all the New York bridges have this kind of like this rail system where you can have this carriage that's the width of the roadway and it'll actually transverse itself all the way down back and forth and they use that obviously for um, inspections and repairs and things like that. Modern bridges that are built, they're not using suspension bridges anymore, right? There's a lot involved in building them. What you will notice is that they're using the diagonal cable stays, you see? And technically speaking, the first one to develop the diagonal cable stay was John Roebling. You see, so the latest design of bridge building for large spans is cable stays. And it was really a, washing, uh, a, a John Roebling invention. Now, if you go over the new um, Tappan Zee Bridge, right? Oh, did I say Tappan Zee Bridge? Oh. They're going to come lock me up now. Really, it's the Mario M. Cuomo Bridge, of course, which to me will always be the Tappan Zee Bridge. Thank you very much. So anyway, you'll notice that the Cuomo Bridge is cable stayed, you see. Um, and you'll see quite a few of those around, you see. But the first bridge to have cable stays wasn't even the Brooklyn Bridge, it was the Cincinnati Suspension Bridge, which was Roebling's bridge even before the Brooklyn Bridge. 
next time you drive over a bridge and you see it as a cable stay span, I hope that you'll remember this part of the presentation. Right at the top of the towers, like I said, you don't want something too sharp, you know, because you want that saddle to kind of like cradle that, you know, the main catenary cable from the anchorage to anchorage, you see, and it's called a saddle. And then if you've ever walked across the Brooklyn Bridge or been on a suspension bridge or near a suspension bridge or stuck in traffic on a suspension bridge, you'll notice that the main cables are actually, there's this annular wiring that goes around it, right? On the Brooklyn Bridge, if you walk across it, you could actually run your nail right over it. And, you know, so they have this special machine, uh, which was another Roebling invention, by the way, that actually took wire and just wound it around, you see, the whole the thing together. 1878, this is almost completed. Um, these things in the foreground are called wrought eye bars. There's a lot of bridges that you will see, and instead of using cables, they will use eye bars, which is kind of like, um, if you're familiar with bicycle links, it's like a, it looks like a big dog bone. Right, it's got a long narrow part and then it's got these two round things at the end with holes in them. And then you put a, a clevis through them or a pin, right? And then you can actually go over something in a, like on a bicycle, it's designed that way so you can go around the sprocket, right? Well, here they're using these so you can go over this big saddle to fasten it to the ground in the anchorage. If you go over a bridge like the Queensboro Bridge or other old bridges, um, you'll see a lot of um, you'll see a lot of these eye bar constructions. Very heavy. Now, in the anchorage itself, you see there's the original wires I was telling you about that were spun back and forth individually a gazillion times, and they go into the anchorage, and they actually splay out into these subgroups of wires. You see, so it's the idea is this tremendous amount of redundancy that if one part of it was to get corroded and, or the other part was to get damaged or whatever it was, that there would be so many others that would still hold the thing, you see, and then the and then and then it's just embedded in cement, you know, like a giant toggle bolt. Um, it, it's really amazing. Oh, look at the old hubcap down here. <laughs> now, this is the Brooklyn side. And it doesn't look like much. It's just this, you know, this structure. I mean, you may have passed this a lot of times either here or near some other suspension bridge. But this is the main cable coming in from the left. And it actually goes over this radius. And then it ties into the ground in, this is the anchorage, the Brooklyn anchorage. It ties into the ground in this big masonry encasement. Right, and that is what holds the whole damn thing up on each side. Right, there's an actual blueprint of it. And uh, <clears throat> like I said, when they're making the roadway, you, you gotta start off from each one of the towers and simultaneously build towards the center and towards the outside simultaneously. So the weight that is being put on the suspended on the suspension cables is exactly symmetrical, right? Now this was a brand new material back in these days. They were actually using a form of steel, right? And that was highly skeptical because nobody knew what this stuff was. You knew the properties of wrought iron, you knew the properties of cast iron, you knew how to work with it, you knew what temperature it became brittle. Nobody really knew what was going to happen with this newfangled material, right? And it was like, you see, the masonry structures were familiar to the 19th century mind, right? You got masonry structures all over the place, um, the oldest of which, like the pyramids, the newest of which, uh, you know, all kinds of buildings. And you knew that that was a strong material. You knew what it could do, cathedrals. But steel, I mean, how do we know that it's not going to get zero degrees outside and it's just going to crack and snap in half? And we're going to have an engineering disaster on our hands. 
you see? So the roadway, once it was completed, actually went through different metamorphoses, you see? So you can see that originally up on top, you know, you had two lanes of horse-drawn whatever going in each direction. And you actually had the, um, the, the above ground train system. And then the only commonality across the ages was the fact that there was a promenade deck. In other words, an, a, a deliberate place to walk across the bridge, you see. And then in 1898, you already had the beginnings of motorized trans, uh, uh, transportation, et cetera. So they got rid of the horse-drawn stuff. And now you've got on the outer lanes in each direction, you've got a place for an automobile. And then you have two different kinds of trains. You've got the trains that are like the steam trains and you've got the trolley track trains. You see the trolley track trains, the trolleys are the ones that have the overhead catenary, you see? So you had a lot of train traffic on this bridge back in the day. And in 1952, the bridge went under, uh, underwent its massive restoration by a guy named John Steinman. And um, what he did was he gave the bridge at what was called the stiffening truss. And you can see those annular stiffing trusses all across. So he stiffened the roadway. And you can see that by 1952 to the present, it's essentially in the same exact configuration. It's three lanes of car traffic each way. And the promenade is still the promenade. And the stiffening truss is there, right? And they got rid of the trains. You know, the trains put an enormous amount of stress on a structure that is actually nothing more than a flexible ribbon. Okay, remember the suspension bridge is like a, leave, a living, breathing thing. When you've got traffic coming from one direction on the train and the traffic coming from another direction on the opposite corner coming the other direction, what that does is it puts the weight on the opposite corners of the span and actually costs the flexible structure to completely twist. Not what you want in an antique structure, okay? And you know they had other problems like this. They did all kinds of computer designs on it. And now the bridges that still have um, train transportation going across in the form of the subway, um, they wait like the Manhattan Bridge is a good example, still has train traffic going across. And you would have to have one train coming from one direction reach the actual middle before the other train coming in the other direction is able to even start on the span because that, that'll keep it from, the term is torquing. It'll keep it from torquing, you see. Uh, you know, these things are old, right? These things are very old. Um, you gotta be careful with the old stuff. Brooklyn Bridge opens, right? Everybody's got the day off. Here's a picture from 1898 of the promenade. Pretty cool, right? Look at the hats and everything. I like these hats. They probably came from Danbury, I bet you, right? And, um, you know, and basically saying, uh, basically speaking, um, this is pretty much as you would see it today. You know, it, it is, it is with obviously the outfits that people are wearing, but the bridge looks the same. It's a national historic landmark which means that even if you're going to improve something, it's got to look like the original, right? So even though the kind of lighting that they're using in the Brooklyn Bridge isn't some kind of a gas light or a carbon arc light or some other kind of crazy thing, and it's a modern light, right? They look like the original lights, you see? Um, there's one major difference here in the photograph from then to now. I wonder if you know what it is. Nobody does, so it's all right. And that is that the wood back in those days went longitudinally, you see? The, the wood that people are walking on. And today the wood goes across, right? That's the only difference. Now this guy over here, it's the first person to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge, Robert Odlem, who was a, a physical, uh, education instructor from Brooklyn, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 
And he had been bragging since they were building the bridge that he's going to be the first one to jump off the bridge. And, you know, cause he's just that good of a swimmer. Right. And he actually was, he was doing this thing where he was like, you know, dressed in clothes and he was walking down the bridge and the cops were on to him. And, um, you know, they would nab him and they would throw him off the bridge. Right. So finally, he's he's determined and he's able to do it. He gets to the middle of the bridge and he sheds his overcoat and his hat and he runs to the edge and jumps off. And uh, soon thereafter, dies of his injuries after hitting the water. So let this be a lesson to all of us. You know, I mean, this is I mean, as a New York kid, this was always a thing, not rubble lublin, but it was always like, you know, those kind of paternal sayings that people would say to you in my house, it was. Um, it was, you know, I still remember my mother saying this, if all of your friends are jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge, does that mean that you have to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge right now? This is good advice, is it not? You know, think for yourself. But it was always the Brooklyn Bridge. Right? <laughs> the other one, the other New York one was don't send me up the river, right, which was obviously Sing Sing where they had the electric chair. Right. Nobody had to say anything more than up the river. Everybody knew where that was and what it was. Those of you who know what I'm talking about know what I'm talking about. You know, here's just a fanciful drawing of from 1990 uh, of what the city is going to look like in 1999 from one of these you know, scientific magazines, you know, and um, it's not far off. I mean, it's a little fanciful. They've got like these dirigibles flying around and stuff like that and bridges all over the place. I mean, not really far off, I mean, from the mind of the 19th century. Here's a nice colorized postcard of the Brooklyn Bridge showing you the trolley traffic and the other traffic, the regular train traffic over the bridge, you know, public transportation. Here's another picture of uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, people walking across the promenade, right? And it, it took me a minute to figure out what these people were doing. And now I understand it's because I don't wear a dress. I, I didn't really think about it at first. She's it, the wind, it's the wind on the bridge is causing people's dress to kick up, right? So being a lady, she's holding her dress. Illustrated newspaper right from the old days. And you know, you got all these people and they're just, I mean, this is like before OSHA, you know, people are just like hanging off of the cables here, painting the thing, right? You know, fell to your death, you fell to your death. Here's a photograph that's taken from the next bridge up. There's the Brooklyn Bridge in the background. And so you've got the next bridge up, which was the Manhattan Bridge. A photographer took a picture of this famous ship coming up that is now gonna hang a right right after the Brooklyn Bridge, I mean, rather the, the Manhattan Bridge into the Brooklyn Navy Yard, okay? Uh, this was a, a ship that was built in the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1915. And this is a photograph of it in 1918. It's a battleship called the USS Arizona, the same Arizona that got blown up and is still remains in Pearl Harbor. But here you can see by 1918, I mean, this is like this bustling metropolis and, this building is still there. There's the Woolworth building. There's the Brooklyn Bridge. Right, so anyway, take a look at this and I'm gonna show you a picture of the Cincinnati suspension span. See, take a look at the profile of the towers. See that? And I'm gonna go back to the Brooklyn Bridge. So you can see the definite family resemblance between one and the other. And uh, you can see that it, this is a photograph of night from 1998 of the Cincinnati Suspension Bridge. And you can see that by this time, it has already been modernized like the Brooklyn Bridge with the stiffening truss on the roadway, you see. But you can see on the Cincinnati Suspend, the Roebling uh, characteristic design of having the, verticals, um, the vertical cables to hold up the roadway and also the diagonal cable stays. Just some artwork. Here's a photograph taken um, from the top of the Brooklyn Tower, 
right? You know, and these cables are designed to be, you know, you can climb up these cables to the top of the towers, you know? I mean, it's not for, they don't want you doing that, but the maintenance people have to do it. And I gotta tell you, it takes a lot of fortitude to be at that kind of height. Um, you know, when I was younger working on Navy ships and stuff, I mean, I was pretty good at that stuff. But right now I think that my knees would be knocking together so badly, I, I'd be paralyzed. Hey, check these two out. They remind me of my grandfather. You know, it's like my father's father. Probably, you know, guys from Europe didn't speak English that well. And um, that's what they look like. I can imagine myself up there painting the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, and dropping the paintbrush on top of somebody's brand new BMW. Whoa, sorry about that, you know. Here's another shot, uh, it was, it was uh, from the Brooklyn Public Library. And uh, you can still see, even though there's not train traffic anymore, they still have the tracks and the street uh, and the cobblestones, right? It's something I always remember from New York. And I was always disappointed when they tore up all of this and they just replaced it with pacing, paving, not necessarily just on the Brooklyn Bridge, but in other places too. Now, when I was a kid walking around with my camera, right, I did this big constitutional, uh, you know, like my graduated high school in 1975, and I walked all over New York City with two cameras, right? And, you know, when I was taking pictures and I developed them all myself, that was my hobby, photography. And uh, this is what New York City looked like. I mean, it was this post-industrial wasteland uh, where you had these brown sites, which meant that the ground was polluted from all of the industry that had been there by the waterfront. And these days now, all of this waterfront property has all been reclaimed and cleaned up and turned into parks and these old warehouses that were worthless and you couldn't give them away and were abandoned are now like, you know, $2 million lofts, you know? And um, I think this is called the Cheese House, if I'm not mistaken. It's just another one of these, you know, these 19th century warehouses, you know, because the ships used to come in and you had a lot of warehouses there to store, you know, whatever, you know, stuff was coming in. I, I bumped up the contrast on this photograph a little bit just to show you that the texture of the, the brickwork and, the, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge, et cetera. Here's another colorized postcard, right? of the promenade. Here's a great shot, right, of the Brooklyn Bridge when it's snowing. Now in New York City, if you get up early enough in a big snowstorm, if you get up early enough, right, and you can, act, it, it's, it's weird because you're used to seeing a million people. You're kind of like, you know, people don't realize, but, you know, sociologically, you, you're, you, we're like pigeons, you know, it's kind of like you get just get used to being around a gazillion people, you know, so you, you lose those boundaries, that sensitivity. And, and so when you're in New York, and there's like nobody around, it's weird, right? It's special. It's like a, a Twilight Zone episode. And the snow, I mean, so here you have this, it turns whatever scene into this kind of like white, pristine, virginal scene. And on top of that, it makes it quiet because the snow absorbs the sound, right? So the snow in New York is nice for about an hour, you know, and after that, it's just this big sloppy mess, of course. But if you get out there early enough, and this is a good, this, this applies to Central Park too. Right, the subway series. And, you know, so this is 1947 and you've got New York City, you know, so you're going from you know, what used to be the, the Brooklyn Dodgers, right? Playing the Yankees uh, and you would take the Brooklyn Bridge, right? Because it was, you know, this interborough affair. And so that's why you've got the bat through the Brooklyn Bridge, because that's how you would take the subway to get up to Yankee Stadium, right? Here's just another advertisement. I mean, it's somebody who's bragging about the fact that they're in New York. Uh, and of course, you know, the Brooklyn Bridge is immediately you're in New York, so.
<laughs> this was in apparently in uh, 2004, the Republican National Convention was in New York City. So here come the Republicans over the Brooklyn Bridge, see? Here's a nice shot, you know, when the Twin Towers were still there, obviously before September 11th, 2001, right? There's the Franklin Delano Drive, Delano Roosevelt Drive, otherwise known as the East River Drive. There's the Woolworth Building. There's the Twin Towers, World Trade Center number one and number two, and of course the Brooklyn Bridge. Now in the, in the approaches to the Brooklyn Bridge, especially on the Manhattan side, uh, there's a very long approach that goes, takes you down to like Chamber Street. And there are all of these archways that were rented out for various things. And this one was for maintenance and it still has all this original hardware in it. Uh, that was hand wrought. It's like Civil War era stuff. Uh, that was part of the original construction of the Brooklyn Bridge. Some plaques on the Brooklyn Bridge. If you ever walk across it, and I hope you do, um, stop and look at that. Right. And and these this these made these archways under the New York um, approach to the bridge. I mean, this was a perfect place to store alcohol. You know, it was like a wine cellar, you see? So this was old champagne and they used to bring all of these ships in from Europe and they used to, you know, this was a, a perfect place to put champagne or wine. You know, it was cool, it was dark. This is from the Brooklyn side. Just another uh, postcard uh, looking up on a, uh, up the East River. Um, there's the Manhattan Bridge. These things are called dolphins, by the way, these things. Uh, in the foreground. Now, back when I was still working in the uh, in the in the city, I, this I think this was from the 1990s. They had they had it was the craziest thing. There was some company that came in and installed these waterfalls in all of these places where you, you would never see a waterfall. And one of them was actually put on the Brooklyn side of the Brooklyn Bridge. Here's a great shot of from a place that doesn't exist anymore called Windows of the World, which is on top of the World Trade Center looking down on the Brooklyn Bridge and the uh, Manhattan Bridge immediately northbound. And um, around the corner there is the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And um, you can see how Roebling's um, cable stays in conjunction with the vertical hangers, give it a web-like, beautiful web-like image. You see, it's very pretty. Now these old, these industrial areas that were wastelands and brown sites, right, um, on, on the Brooklyn side, et cetera, have now all been, you know, cleaned up, sanitized, and turned into, you know, pristine waterfront property, right? This is from the Brooklyn side. This is a beautiful picture of some of the brickwork in the Gothic arches of the Brooklyn Bridge taken with a probably a 28 millimeter wide angle lens. There are those um, strengthening supports that John Steinman installed, you know, because there's so much traffic and so much weight on the bridge now, even in the 1950s, you would need that. And here is something that became kind of a phenomenon uh, this was just starting up by the time I was like out of the city. So in the 2000s, et cetera, there was this thing called, they called love locks. And uh, this this was done a lot on the bridges over the Seine in France and Paris. And, you know, you'd go out there with your sweetheart, apparently, and the two of you would be holding an open lock with one key. And you would express your love for each other forever. You would snapshot the lock onto the bridge structure. And then you take the key and you toss it into the river, right? So in other words, that's it. You're hooked up now. And uh, you're very romantic, right? So I wonder how many people are down there right now swimming around looking for that key, you know? Uh, and what happened, uh, I don't know about what happened here in New York, but what, what happened in France is, you know, those bridges are also antique bridges. And they had to start snipping off the locks because there were thousands of locks on them. And it was adding, actually accumulating to a significant weight problem. So, but that's another story. And here's just a photograph um, of somebody taking a picture of their, hopefully their wife. Um, but who am I to judge? 
And it's a beautiful shot. Um, you know, when I used to, back in the day, I used to take my, the people I was dating and the last person I did this with was my wife. And, you know, that was like 32 years ago, 33 years ago now. And, um, and I would go to Chinatown for dinner and then we'd go for a walk across the Brooklyn Bridge, just like, you know, as would be here at, with the sun going down. It's really beautiful. And then you go back and go to Little Italy and have some espresso or some cannolis or something. And, you know, as far as I was concerned, if uh, the young lady wasn't interested in me after all that, then she probably wasn't worth it. So there. Um, and it's just a beautiful thing to do. Uh, it's free. Uh, I hope that you put it on your bucket list to do if you've never done it to just take a walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. And it's really something. There's not another experience like it. Anyway, there's our program. I hope you found that interesting. I didn't want to go overboard with the technical details or anything else like that, but we're into it now, an hour and a half plus two. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, if you, anybody's got any questions, I'd be glad to entertain a few. And I wanna say thank you to everybody who came today. Um, we don't have any questions that are in the chat currently. So if you do have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. You can also pop it into that chat box and we'll get to you right away. Our next program is in two weeks, the Chrysler Building. That's going to be April 27th, again at 2 p.m. You're also automatically registered for the Ukraine program, which is going to be on Monday the 18th at 2 p.m. If you have a question that you think of after the program is over, feel free to respond to that Zoom invitation and that will come right to me and I'll forward those questions over to Arthur. And we do have one that just came up here in the chat. Did they know about Rust? Whoops fell down. Yeah, they knew about Rust. And there was actually the Brooklyn Bridge wasn't that bad about it. Uh, the worst bridge that was that suffered from Rust was actually the Williamsburg Bridge. And the Williamsburg Bridge had so much rust on it, as far as the main cables were concerned, that they were thinking that they actually had to tear the thing down and put a new bridge up. But they decided from the standpoint of traditionality that they would keep the thing, but they had to like literally rebuild it from from the from the molecules out. You know, let's see. Remember that in New York City. Right. Remember those pictures I was telling you from uh, I was telling you that story from like 1975, you know, when I was walking around with a couple of cameras that the New York City. Was probably at its historical low point in the early 1970s. And they were broke, they were bankrupt. They didn't have money to paint anything. And, um, and there was a tremendous amount of deterioration that was going on. The bridges did not receive the maintenance that they should have gotten. And so there was a period of time in the 60s and the 70s into the 80s where there was a tremendous degradation of some of the structures. And the Williamsburg was always the kind of like the ugly duckling of the bridges on the East River. And it was, they just, they weren't maintaining it. Um, and then they found when things got better by the 1990s that it had suffered a tremendous degradation as far as its structural integrity. But all of that's been taken care of now. And I hope that New York isn't headed or has already headed back to another period of a low place as far as, you know, things like maintenance or money or something like that. Um, I'll leave that for another story. Uh, but the Brooklyn Bridge, because it was a national historic landmark, enjoyed greater attention of maintenance. I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much for being here today, Arthur. Um, again, if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. And also all of the videos that Arthur has done for us are up on YouTube. This one will be up in a couple of days, so you can check those out um, maybe over the Easter break. Everyone have a good holiday and I'll see you guys in two weeks. Thank you, Arthur. Bye-bye now. Thank you. You're welcome.